Today I'm going to be talking about our experiences with the latest direct RNA chemistry and how nanopore tRNA sequencing is providing us with unique insights into the first chemical modifications that decorate RNA. So first, a quick primer. Um, we refer to the complete set of DNA modifications as the epigenome, and thus correspondingly, the collective set of RNA and its modifications is called the epitranscriptome, and both of these terms describe an additional layer of information on top of the nucleic acid sequence. However, while on DNA, um, you can find a half dozen or so unique modifications. On RNA, we know that there are more than 170 distinct modifications. And so detecting these epigenetic modifications is uh, currently fairly straightforward in nanopore sequencing, um, and the following speakers will be talking a lot more about this. Um, Oxford nanopore is trained base colors to identify common DNA modifications in uh, all sequence contexts. Detecting RNA modifications is really an area of active research. So there is currently, a, well, at the time I put this talk together, there was a Dorado model, mo model to detect M6A within a specific sequence motif context. Last night, there were some updates that now allows this in all contexts, uh, all sequence contexts, uh, as well as pseudouridine calling. Um, and individual research groups, including our own, have also characterized a handful of other modifications via the previous direct RNA chemistry, which I'll refer to as RNA002 during this talk. And some of them have gone on and trained their own base callers um, to identify some of these modifications. But updates to the direct RNA sequencing chemistry uh, within the last few months really merit revisiting each and every one of these studies. Uh, towards the eventual goal of being able to detect all modifications on all RNA in any sequence context. And this is an ambitious and non-trivial challenge. The U.S. National Academy of Sciences recently released a report calling for investments basically on par with the Human Genome Project to achieve end-to-end -end sequencing of the entire human epitranscriptome. And nanopore sequencing is going to be one of the key technologies that's going to enable us to achieve this. So our group is really interested in tRNAs. These are the most abundant RNA molecules in cells, and they literally bridge the gap between the mRNA sequence and then the nascent polypeptide chain within the context of the ribosome. And um, so tRNAs function comes from a combination of their sequence, their structure, and the amino acid that they are charged with, and uh, as well as the many chemical modifications that decorate these molecules. And we know a fair bit about these modifications from orthogonal methods such as mass spec. Um, this information is cataloged, albeit indirectly, in a database called Medomics, um, particularly for high stoichiometry modifications. Um, and in this database, you can find information on all modifications that have been observed within a particular tRNA isodecoder, so uh, a tRNA gene, that um, encodes a uh, specific anticodon and is charged with a particular amino acid. Um, and several groups, including our own, have nanopore sequenced tRNAs, albeit mostly in medium throughput experiments due to library yield issues, because um, these, are, these are fairly challenging molecules to work with. So when we got our hands on the new direct RNA sequencing chemistry late last year, we wanted to know two things. First, we wanted to know how does the new chemistry perform for tRNA sequencing? And second, what about the modifications that we know occur on tRNA? What do they look like in these data? So we performed match sequencing of tRNA inputs um, from six different species where the same library was split in half and ligated to helicase-loaded adapters for either the RNA002 or the new RNA004 chemistry. We sequenced these on the corresponding flow cells, and the first thing we found was we get consistently higher yields with this second-generation direct RNA sequencing in blue. And so this metric that I'm showing here, our PPPM, um, was something that we developed to provide a more apples-to-apples -apples comparison um, across uh, sequencing runs that might be performed on uh, for different lengths of time or on different platforms, both of which we actually did in these experiments. So this plot shows the total library throughput divided by the number of pores available on a flow cell at the start of the run divided by the number of minutes that the run was uh, performed for. Um, and what this shows us is that across the board, we're getting about an order of magnitude more reads per library. 
So we've also confirmed that the abundance of different tRNAs uh, that we capture using these two methods is reproducible. You can see in these PCA plots um, that uh, our libraries segregate by species of organism and not by chemistry. So the RNA002 and 004 look uh, quite similar. If we zoom in on just one species, like our human sample, um, and look at the uh, correlation between different tRNA isodecoders, uh, they looked um, really, there's good correlation between individual tRNA iso isoacceptor and isodecoder abundance between both chemistries. Um, so having validated that this approach performed similarly with higher throughput, we were curious what else we'd be able to detect with this additional depth. And one fascinating and understudied area of tRNA biology, biology can be found in mitochondria, um, which routinely encode their own tRNA repertoires. So mismodification of mitochondrial tRNAs can cause serious human disorders, including cardiomyopathies and encephalopathies. And these are rare diseases where our understanding of the underlying molecular etiology is generally lacking, motivating a further study. So previously, um, with the 002 chemistry, I was only able to identify a handful of reads for any given mitochondrial tRNA isodecoder, consistent with the fact that these uh, mitochondrial tRNA species make up a really small percentage overall of the tRNAs at cells. But now that we can sequence deeper, we wanted to know if we could detect these molecules. Um, so to answer this question, we took advantage of the fact that um, Respiration, and therefore mitochondrial function, is dispensable in budding yeast. So our talented technician, Kezia Dobson, here on this slide, made what are called a teat yeast, where you can disrupt the mitochondrial genomes with ethidium bromide, and then isolated and sequenced the tRNA from these cells. When we, when we map these data uh, to a shared reference genome containing nuclear and mitochondrial encoded tRNA genes, we see a reduction in reads aligning to mitochondrial tRNAs, which are the ones here in green, in petite yeast. And then furthermore, if we look at sequencing reads in wild-type yeast compared to yeast where the pseudouridine synthase, PAS2, which acts specifically on mitochondrial tRNAs and not nuclear encoded tRNAs. Um, so if we have a mutant where this, uh, this synthase is disrupted, we see a loss of mismatching specifically at sites that it acts upon. Um, and uh, this is similar to what was seen in previously with the RNA002 chemistry for pseudouridines. We see that many of these U's, um, which are coded in red on this plot at right, are being miscalled as C's in blue uh, when there's a pseudouridine present. Um, so this tells us that our mitochondrial tRNAs are true tRNAs and also that we can see mod mod modifications upon them. Um, and uh, this type of signal is true not just for this specific pseudouridylated site, but actually for uh, all the pseudouridine sites uh, that we know are present on all of the tRNAs from all of the six species that we sequenced, um, uh, albeit to varying degrees uh, depending on uh, both sequence context as well as neighboring modifications, because tRNAs have a whole lot of modifications they're really crammed into a relatively small sequence space. Um, so on this plot, um, I'm showing you on the x-axis a whole bunch of different sequence contexts where we have at least 30 direct RNA reads uh, aligning to that sequence context. Uh, the plot at the top is showing the uh, mean mismatch frequency across each of these sequence contexts, which varies from 25 to 75%. So this is really sequence level uh, signal of an RNA modification that's present. And then at the bottom, you could see that across the board, there's a whole bunch of uh, miscalling, or uh, which is actually indicative of biology, of uh, pseudouridines that are now being miscalled as cytosines. Um, but of course, we know that tRNAs contain far more types of modifications than just pseudouridine, so we wanted to know what do all of these modifications look like. So here, I am plotting the distribution of mismatch frequencies for each of the 46 different modifications that have been annotated on tRNAs from the six species that we sampled. And on this plot, each dot represents a, uh, a unique sequence context where we, again, have at least uh, 30 direct RNA sequencing reads aligning. So on the right side of this plot, 
um, we can see modifications that routinely generate signal distortions that are capable of confusing the base color. So really strong signal from a collection of modifications. Um, and so this plot can actually help us identify which modifications represent low hanging fruit for future efforts to train models to identify these epitranscriptomic marks. Lastly, we've also looked at tRNA in an infection context in collaboration with Breck Dukrup's lab, also at the University of Colorado. And like mitochondria, but maybe even more mysteriously, many sage encode a small repertoire of tRNAs within their genomes, despite the fact that they otherwise rely on their bacterial host translational machinery um, in order to make proteins. Um, so when we sequence tRNA from E. coli, either before or during a T4 phage infection, not only do we see this expected increase in tRNA reads uh, derived from the phage genome, which are the ones in green here, um, but we also see some interesting and specific changes in base calling error on the host tRNAs. Um, and so this is suggestive of the fact that there may be some remodeling of RNA modifications on the bacterial uh, tRNAs in response to the infection itself. And this is something that Jill Billadou, who is a graduate student in our lab, is going to be looking into more in her thesis work. So um, with that, today I've shown you um, how we've leveraged tRNA, which are really like a combinatorial chemistry playground uh, in the RNA world. Um, to look at the largest number of RNA modifications uh, characterized in nanopore sequencing to date, so we've, I've shown you just base calling error data here for these 46 different uh, types of marks. But these signatures allow us to identify a set of RNA modifications um, where we expect to find really strong distortions in the raw nanopore signal. And so we're motivated to dig in deeper and to start trying to train some models to detect these modifications de novo. Um, and moreover, even without these models, we've shown that we can use nanopore tRNA sequencing to uh, look at changes in modification status and look at low abundance tRNAs with really exciting implications for the study of host parasite interactions and human mitochondrial disease. So with that, um, I'm just going to thank the entirety of the Hasselberg Lab, including alumni on this project, my colleagues in the RBI bioinformatics team, our funding, and last, um, all of the co-authors here who showed up for this tRNA sequencing workshop, which was really the jumping off point for this project. Many of them had never sequenced a nanopore library to that before that day, and all of them got successful libraries, and uh, that was the source of the data in the stock. So, off those, and thank you. <laughs>